Hello and welcome to the Rogers Brief. I'm Adam Rogers. Thank you for watching and thank you for listening. A uh, special thank you, I guess, this time around. This is day 75 of the Mass Casualty Commission proceedings and it's the last day. It was the final presentations today from uh, some of the participants and then some closing remarks from the commissioners. So that means in a way that, well, that means that this is also my final uh, daily summary video and I've made, uh, I've got all 75 days covered. In addition, as covered some earlier issues before the proceedings were started and a few others along the way, some additional ones. I didn't count them up total yet, but uh, certainly there's got to be close to 100 there. So for people that have been watching and following along, a uh, real sincere thank you to everybody. It's uh, been a worthwhile exercise from my perspective. I've enjoyed doing the videos and bringing them to your attention and following along with the mass casualty. There should be so many issues to cover and a lot of uh, different uh, legal angles too. So I hope that people have enjoyed the coverage and uh, just uh, thinking ahead a little bit, uh, you know, this is done and I'm going to be, as I discussed before here, working on a final written report, which I'm going to release uh, in October. Uh, we know that the commission's report is not coming until the end of March. So it'll be some something to read in the meantime. Uh, and I think uh, people will find it persuasive. I hope so. Uh, I've been following along quite closely and making lots of notes and I've got a good start on the final report already. But the other thing I want to do is continue making videos for the general public. And I've got to think a little bit about how I'm going to structure it. But what I have in mind is to provide sort of a, probably weekly. Uh, we'll see how uh, that all shakes out. But summaries of issues, legal issues that are, or, or issues with a legal angle uh, that I can discuss sort of on a weekly basis that are in the news, whether it's in Nova Scotia, uh, national issues that have uh, Nova Scotian angle or international issues that I think just are of interest and have uh, some legal angles that uh, you may find of interest. So watch for that to come in the next little while. And uh, so you'll continue to have an opportunity, at least whether you wish to or not, to uh, to get some more legal analysis. All right. So enough of that. Uh, today, today there were uh, four presentations. So there was the BC Civil Liberties Association East Coast Prison Justice presentation from Ben Perriman, which was quite good. Uh, Samantha Paris, who I think this is her first appearance, uh, made a pr presentation on behalf of the province of Nova Scotia, the Department of Justice, uh, Nash Najawan, who we've seen many times for the National Police Federation, and then Laurie Ward on behalf of the uh, Department of Justice federally. Then there were some final remarks from each of the commissioners. So I'm going to cover all of that. And uh, But first, there was actually a, another, just like yesterday, Jamie Van Wart, one of the Mass Casualty Commission lawyers, stood up before anything got started and said, well, we have more documents to introduce and uh, things. But in a, so there was 121 new documents, which he said included 30 new interviews. Now, those haven't been posted to the Mass Casualty Commission website as of yet. The other thing that's not yet posted was the indication uh, yesterday, or the day before, when there was a question about a report that was done on the investigation that the commission did into the potential of Wartman being connected to the police as an agent or informant. That report, the investigation, the conclusions is supposed to be posted to the commission website. It hasn't, it's not there yet. Uh, I'll be keeping an eye out for it and making comments in some form once I see it. The other thing was that Mr. Van Wart indicated was 25 additions and corrections. Uh, to foundational documents. Now, he went through which foundational documents were affected, but uh, didn't indicate what, if any, of these uh, corrections or additions were uh, significant, what they were all about, or what uh, factual areas they covered. The other thing I thought was interesting that uh, Jamie Van Wart mentioned was that these found, he was, it was sort of a reminder, but it was something hidden in this reminder. He said the reminder that these foundational documents are not findings of fact. He said those findings of fact will be established when we write the final report. So he used the word we in the sense of the commission. Now, We've heard throughout from the commissioners, from Chief Commissioner McDonald in particular, and in the interim report that the Mass Casualty Commission lawyers are 
supposed to be, you know, of course they're working with the commissioners to an extent, but they're also supposed to be like a crown prosecutor, so have a degree of independence. Um, and here we have seen that the, so I, I questioned earlier in the week, why aren't the commission lawyers providing their final submissions? And perhaps this is part of the answer that they are going to be helping the commissioners write the report. So there's an overlap of duties there that you would not see. You wouldn't see a Crown Prosecutor helping the judge write a decision. They would provide their submissions. And what um, Edward Tushney in his textbook there uh, has said that that is useful as a sort of a foundation for the commissioner's final report. You know, one that other parties can sort of either support, attack, supplement, whatever, in order to give the commissioner sort of a fulsome picture of everything that's been heard. But, uh, so there may, may be a, uh, a little role confusion there, deliberately or not. Okay, so first presentation was from Ben Perriman, like I said, from East Coast Prison Justice and the BC Civil Liberties Association. Now, he was, uh, he pulled no punches. He called it a catastrophic failure of policing and that the public safety status quo failed and so that tinkering with the system was not going to be good enough. There needed to be a significant uh, set of uh, recommendations coming from this, something that would, you know, uh, disrupt the status quo. He uh, reminded us of what he described as the hostile stance taken by the RCMP towards the inquiry from the beginning, which actually included today, as we'll get to with uh, Ms. Ward's presentation, that the first thing they did uh, after the uh, mass casualty was bring in a strategic communication staff, draft misleading and false statements, which they provided to the public in their public briefings. Then they tried to undermine the alert ready system and enlist other police forces in Nova Scotia to try to support them. The other police forces didn't, but that was an attempt made by the RCMP that they tried to get the Truro police to hold back on the on releasing the bulletin the criminal intelligence bulletin that was uh, discovered in the system that they were they were this RCMP was slow and reluctant in their approach to disclosure and that when the inquiry was announced the first thing that each division did was hire the spouses of senior officers to work on it uh, to be sort of their liaison and uh, their point people in terms of the inquiry and then also promptly manufactured false business cards to mislead people into thinking they were part of the Mass Casualty Commission when in fact they were still working for the RCMP. All right, so that was uh, his, some comments on the RCMP. The other thing he said is that the research from the Mass Casualty Commission has shown that there's very little police oversight, uh, there's low budgets for that, not very effective police oversight, and no accessible complaints process for people to complain about the uh, the police particularly for marginalized communities who feel that there's no accessible in several senses uh, complaints process when it comes to police activity all right one of the things he talked about was uh, that where disclosure was resisted was something we hadn't heard before I hadn't anyway which was constable Wiley's 2006 2007 employment review a documentation which showed that he had a few complaints this might have been i think it was his first year of working and that one of part of the advice or the conclusion from the complaints process was that constable wiley shouldn't get personally involved with people under investigation now, we don't know the details of that one necessarily they weren't brought forward today in mr perryman's limited time but of course we see that uh, he seemed to have gotten a little too personally involved with uh, gabriel wartman as he was dealing with him as uh, purportedly pro-police community contact. And then uh, Mr. Perryman also reminded us that the province, the federal government, and the RCMP all resisted, didn't want this inquiry to take place. So, uh, next was uh, Samantha Paris from the Department of Justice uh, for Nova Scotia, who indicated that she was there with uh, Ed Gores, who's the senior lawyer at the uh, DOJ, and Glenn Anderson, who was at the Desmond Inquiry, I'm not sure we've seen any of them on camera uh, yet. Uh, Miss Paris, uh, she's not junior. She was called to the bar in 2016, so she's been around for uh, six years. 
very brief presentation, about uh, I think 20 minutes or so, maybe a little less than that. Spent the first five minutes uh, just going through the order in council, uh, broadly sort of explaining and reviewing the process, which we all knew it was sort of uh, wasted time. I'd said earlier in the week that these these closing statement, the, every second, every sentence is precious, every word is thought through, um, and here uh, Department of Justice provincially was just they're just sort of, you know, ragging the puck, trying to use up their time talking about the orders in council without really saying anything substantive about them. She said that the province has been fully engaged in the Mass Casualty Commission, and I have seen no evidence of that. I mean, there's been a few uh, times uh, where people from the Department of Justice have participated in panels, but other than that, I don't see any real substantive uh, participation. Uh, she didn't make any recommendations, really, other than she said uh, the recommendations should be specific when it comes to which level of government is most responsible or is responsible for enacting the recommendation, uh, as though to imply, please not us, uh, please make it so that it's other levels of government. She did talk about two things. One, she spent a lot of time talking about the TMR radio system. Uh, her view or the province's view of it is that the system worked just fine and it was the users, the police officers who just didn't know how to use it. Second thing was that she talked about uh, the policing structure in Nova Scotia and says that policing standards, that there's a modernization process underway. We heard a little bit about this uh, alluded to more so than described and that she wishes that the commission would acknowledge that that modernization is taking place. I'm not sure if they'll do that or not. I mean, they may, they may say that that's ongoing, but uh, there's we don't have a lot of information about how um, how that's working or who's all involved in that as of yet. To I don't think the commission's going to make any findings on particular um, policing standard adoptions. Natasha, or sorry, Nasha Najawan from the National Police Federation. Uh, the National Police Federation has taken a lot of heat throughout the Mass Casualty Commission. Uh, but uh, so today they, they repeated some of the things we've been hearing throughout. Very proud of their members. It's a new union, only incorporated in 2021. So after the events, uh, that the officers have suffered relentless criticism from the media, and in part from the commission itself, and that's had a negative impact on their wellness. She also said that the members are lacking confidence in the RCMP to uh, their internal support systems, mental support, mental health support, and that many have gone to private counselors as a result of that. And uh, of course, that any training or policies that are suggested, recommended, must uh, include recommendations for funding as well, or else things are just going to get worse. All right, so uh, not much of a surprise from uh, Ms. Najawan from the Police Federation. Last uh, presentation of the four was Lori Ward from the Department of Justice, uh, which represents the RCMP as an entity, or includes the RCMP as an entity. And Ms. Ward, who was, uh, I was also familiar with from the Desmond Inquiry, and great respect for her abilities as a lawyer, but uh, off the top, she got very emotional as she started, uh, you know, thinking of uh, the families or expressing remorse. And actually later when she was talking about Cobbled Court and the failure to you know, canvas that area uh, in a timely fashion and the failure at the Gina Galay crime scene to deal with that properly. Uh, she got very emotional, uh, had to take a moment, which uh, to me is always a surprise as a lawyer, particularly making a, a closing submission. Uh, they, you know, you're supposed to have prepared your intellectual arguments and you're trying to reason things through and uh, make your submissions. And so, you know, when you get emotional like that, it's, I don't want to say it's unprofessional, but it shows, it shows that there's a bit, the lawyer's a bit too close to the clients in those cases where they're getting emotionally attached and involved. You should be dispassionate and make your arguments. Uh, I think it detracts from your arguments when you have a, a tone of emotion to them. Now, uh, Miss Ward did, uh, as uh, I would have expected from her, stressing and reminding us, I guess, how unprecedented these events were when they happened. It's easy when you analyze something for two years to think, you know, you, it sort of settles in your mind, but at the time, yes, it was unprecedented and difficult to predict. 
She again, though, tried to undermine the alert ready system, saying that no one had used it before, no one had a policy in place, and suggests that progress in this area since then has shown a willingness on the RCMP to adapt to recommendations and um, new circumstances. Uh, the issue of the confusion of uh, who is in command, she says, you know, those in command knew who was in command. And it's not a big surprise that those on the ground didn't have a sense of the overall command structure uh, necessarily. The uh, ATAC, that's a, an acronym, basically says the officers having GPS on their phones, which would have helped in the uh, wooded area of port -Pic. That is coming to all members by the end of uh, next year, 2023. So uh, I guess trying to suggest that there's progress being made there. Reminded uh, the Mass Casualty Commission commissioners uh, twice that the commission is not supposed to be about assigning blame. Uh, which, of course, when you're the entity that is going to have blame assigned to it, you would uh, you would want to give that reminder. Uh, says that uh, reminds us that uh, Wardman could have killed more people that night if not or that day the day of the 19th if not for the RCMP's intervention. Now, uh, after Miss Ward was finished, uh, there was a, just a two or three minute break, and then the commissioners made their final remarks. Um, uh, Commissioner McDonald started off, he made another, a new land acknowledgement, which was done at the beginning of the day. Uh, so I'm not sure why he repeated that, but he did. Comment, uh, made some comments on the depth of grief that was, uh, you know, pervasive throughout the proceedings. And, I mean, what I'd say about the commissioner's comments total, that none of these comments that they said today uh, were, uh, or should, maybe I'll phrase it another way. All, everything that they said in their closing comments could have been and may have been written before proceedings started. Other than the, they listed the specific number of witnesses and panelists and these sorts of things, but... Nothing they said showed any reflection on the evidence that was heard, or any any sense of where they may uh, where they may fall on issues where there's uh, differing opinions. None of that. They just uh, but they all spoke for a while. Uh, Commissioner McDonald went through uh, just basically listed the foundational documents and what the you know the titles of them. Really, he the, the he, he had this slow, solemn tone about him which I think, I guess, was meant to add weight to what to me were otherwise kind of vapid comments. Really, it was just listing out the titles of the foundational documents, uh, that there was, I think, 60 witnesses called, 45 supplemental reports, expert panels. Um, Stanton, Commissioner Stanton talked about the expert panels and, and, again, just sort of listed those out. And then uh, Commissioner Fitch uh, got up and thanked everybody and listed the people out that needed to be thanked. But there was, like I say, nothing that was said today that couldn't have been written, uh, much like the interim report. Uh, if you remember, the interim report could have been and may have been written before the hearings even began. But anyway, they uh, so they gave their final remarks, uh, and they'll said they'll be seeing less of them over the next while. I'm not sure we'll be seeing any of them. Uh, their final report is going to be submitted at the end of March. There'll be no proceedings in the meantime. Uh, the opportunity for the public to submit any thoughts, recommendations is up until the end of uh, September, so the next week, and then that's it. We won't see anything until the final report, I suspect. So uh, they also, the commissioners did urge the public and everybody participating to help uh, implement the recommendations when they are when they when they are made. So. We'll wait to hear the, uh, we'll wait to see the final report when it comes out in, um, let's see, October, November, December, February, March, some months time. <laughs> and uh, till then, uh, you'll have my report next month to uh, review and uh, hopefully some news on um, a new version of this uh, YouTube presentation of whatever the Rogers brief uh, may become. So. Thank you very much uh, for uh, being with me on this, uh, this journey of a sense, and uh, we'll see you again in another uh, another form. And I'll be back uh, with other 
you know, when I when I'm ready to release the uh, my own report, I'll come back on and uh, give some some summaries or some sec sections of that as well, so that you'll uh, you'll know what to expect before the document comes. So until then, uh, thanks again for watching, thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time.